So we have, uh, we have two groups here tonight. We have the people who are working in our workshop, which is sort of brutal and tough, and then we have people who are sort of mildly interested in generative art and quite likely have never heard of it. So uh, we'll sort of start easy with you here, sort of easy and, and gently. Um, I want to start with, let's just see here if I can dig my way into the entrails of this presentation system. Are we in alphabetical order? There we go. Okay, uh, now I've known about generative art for quite a while because it's not a, uh, it's not a new enterprise. And there are a number of uh, children's toys actually that use very classical generative art principles, like say the spirograph. If you're a little kid, somebody will get you the spirograph. Let's say, uh, you know, it's a little device that uses plastic cog wheels and it has colored pins. And you fit the pins into these little mechanical wheels and you move them around. And you don't really know what the outcome of this process is going to be. You just sort of imagine it's going to be pretty. And in fact, it ends up being rather startlingly pretty, probably more than you imagined. A kaleidoscope is a generative art device. It's uh, built in the mid-1850s by Sir David Brewster, Victoria, an optical scientist. It's a device, very simple inside, just chips of colored glass. All you have to do is twist it, hold it up to the light, and you can generate patterns, which are really quite wonderful and sort of gorgeous, and there's kind of a lot of them. Uh, so, you know, there are aspects of generative art that are well over half a century old, and I knew about it and you know, it was something that I had filed away in the back of my mind until last year about this time, uh, you know, late November 2007, when I happened to go to Berlin for Transmediala and I walked into this, which was a show put together by uh, Marius Watts. He was running a workshop called Generator X. Now, Marius has done workshops on several continents. Marius is Norwegian. He was working in Berlin at the time. He's currently working in New York. He was in residency in Ohio for a little while. But Marius is a pretty advanced thinker in generative practice, and he's one of the first people to do generated three-dimensional objects rather than just kaleidoscope-like patterns, screensavers, video jockey work, and so forth. These little sculptures, the little white ones there, little round dome-like guys, that's Marius's own work. These little uh, uh, laser-cut bits here, sort of regular little modular assembly system, that's the work of Jared Tarbell, artist from um, New Mexico, has a website called Levitated Net which I recommend quite highly. And this very complex cactus-like device here is made from laser-cut cardboard. Now, why do generative artists like really plain materials, like this uniform plastic, this uh, cardboard, and this fiberboard, and these white monochrome plastics? The reason they choose these kind of materials Three reasons, really. First, they're easy to work. Second, they're cheap. And third, they show what generative artists always want to show, which is process. They're trying to show process of what they've done with this. They're trying to make the code visible. They do not design objects. I mean, the objects are a kind of hard copy of the work, which is designing process. And they've come up with processes and then these are sort of hard outputs of processes. So this is some um, generative artwork from the mid-1960s. Now as soon as graphic artists heard the computer scientists had invented things like algorithms and software, they immediately realized, almost instantly, that you could write software and like use it to generate graphic images. Why am I using this old-fashioned pencil and this triangle and all this ink and so forth when I can simply get the computer to like do something for me? I'll simply write a set of rules and have it go and do some graphics. Well, the flourishing field of computer graphics as we know and love it today came from those impulses, but the other impulse was generative art. 
which is to write a process where you yourself do not know the outcome. You're going to sort of set the computer free and let it explore spaces that you cannot imagine and that you yourself could not do in a hundred years, no matter what the tools. Now here is a piece of graphic artwork which is basically unimaginable by a human being because it's produced by software in the mid-1960s. You can see, okay, it's black and white, not very sophisticated, doesn't have drop shadows, there's no gorgeous three-dimensionality, it's not in two million colors. There's a little brother system, different artists, same period. You see he's doing sort of regular modules. There's a little process here, there's a black spot, another little process, another little black spot. He's kind of methodically working his way through a system, little system of modules. In fact, you look at it, you can kind of see there's a logic to it. Okay, he's connecting dots, he's drawing lines, there's vertical lines, there's horizontal lines. And if you spent enough time with it, you'd sort of be able to tease out the software behind it. All right, well, this was 40-odd years ago. All right, this came off Flickr. This is just a regular enterprise off the uh, generative and evolutionary art set on Flickr.com, which is a uh, photo sharing service owned by Yahoo designed on beautiful Web 2.0 participatory systems, I might add, so that whoever it was who was putting this together, and he's not a particularly distinguished generative artist, he's basically just a random guy off Flickr running contemporary software, basically doing the same thing as this, just much better hardware and software. I mean, the chips that are doing this, I mean, look at this color system. Look at the blending, look at the scraping, look at everything that's going on in there. Okay, here's this one. It's got some three-dimensionality to it. You can actually see that it's like some kind of frozen animation. There's like pieces of it moving through a three-dimensional volume. The spines are coming out. There's some kind of calculation there. It's considerably more sophisticated piece of processing machinery. Not really that much of a conceptual advance over this. Just plain, much better machinery, really. You know, and this actually looks rather otherworldly. I mean, this, when you look at it, it's like, okay, it would be very hard to do this by hand, but not entirely impossible. I mean, it's just too two sets, and if you put your mind to it, you could copy that manually, get a machine to do it. This, uh-uh. There's really no way back from this. This is the kind of image that cannot be produced through human methods or even mechanical methods. It's, it was not expected, it was not pre-planned on the part of the, of the artist. This is a process more or less running free. And it's like, put us into a space where we're seeing something that was literally impossible to produce under 21st, 20th century conditions. This is really a new thing in the world. Not really pretty, but very novel, and that always arouses my interest as a journalist, as a futurist, as a critic. Like, what the heck is it? What's going on there? So, Here's another form of generative art, which is not really generative art, it's generative design or information visualization. And the, uh, what you're seeing here is commentary on Usenet, which is a